Forty years ago, the NFL staged a game for the ages. To this day, it's the longest pro football game ever played. Much of the footage from that game was lost. The film was not cataloged. The TV broadcast was not saved. Forty years later, NFL Films went looking for it. This is the end result. It's an empty lot today at 22nd Street and Brooklyn Avenue. A designated site for low-cost inner-city housing units. But 40 years ago, it was the thriving center of the Kansas City sports scene. Chiefs Souvenir Championship pennants, pick them right out. Souvenir Championship pennants, pick them right out now. We got that championship pennant right here. It's program of today's game of the Dolphins right here, just one dollar. Program right here, only one dollar. Really one of the most distinctive stadiums in pro football during the 60s. It wasn't just that it was a baseball stadium repurposed for football, because that was done in a lot of places. But there were all sorts of small touches that you saw at Municipal Stadium that you didn't see anywhere else. You've got war paint riding around the field every time after the Chiefs score. You've got a large drum in one end zone that the cheerleaders are banging on. You've got Tony DiPardo who used to play in supper clubs in Kansas City and his Zing band playing in one corner. My dad was the music director for the Kansas City Chiefs, and my dad's band was right in the end zone. So I was always really close at hand and being uh, near him in the music cues. This was going to be our last game at Municipal Stadium. We knew this fabulous structure was being built called Arrowhead, but Municipal was home in that it all began there. And so it was the kind of the sadness of saying goodbye. Municipal's curtain call would also be the first home playoff game in Chiefs history. And it was only the second postseason appearance for the Miami Dolphins, an expansion team that learned the winning habit from its head coach. I came to Miami in 1970, and the Dolphins were 3-10-1 the year before I got here. We turned it around, we went 10-4 and four my first year, and that gave us the hunger and the thirst to do something bigger and better. 71 was a year that we improved as a team. We, we improved our timing, uh, our togetherness, and I think we gained a lot of confidence in the fact that we prided ourselves, even then, on not making mental errors. Miami won its first ever division title but now would have to face a Chiefs team looking for its third Super Bowl trip in six years. 71 team, it came together well. By that time, you're a little bit more mature. Players have played together a little bit longer. Uh, your ability to perform at a level comfortably was, I think, even more pronounced. With 11 Pro Bowlers on their roster, the Chiefs figured to extend their 6-0 all-time record over Miami. My eyes were as big as saucers when I played those guys because that was the elite in the old AFL and uh, now the AFC. Those were the best. We went into Kansas City. We just wanted to play well. We just wanted to be respectable. I expected us to play hard, but in reality, uh, offensively and defensively, they were a much better football team than us. The Dolphins did have one advantage. They brought Miami weather to the heartland with a game time temperature of 63 degrees. It was hardly the Arctic conditions expected for the first day of Christmas games in NFL history. There had been some controversy about it because Christmas was still strictly observed. It was not a time with a lot of sports on television, and this was clearly breaking from that precedent. When we got the tickets and it said the game on Christmas Day, we said, whoa, the Chiefs has made a big mistake. Who plays football on Christmas? I didn't think anybody would ever go to the game on Christmas, but no way. Everybody in Kansas City wanted a ticket. That was the hottest ticket in town. Chiefs 
Chiefs are having playing on Christmas Day. Do you have a nice Christmas? We didn't want to be away from home on Christmas Day, but we loved it. That means we're pretty good if, if we're in the playoffs and we're playing the Kansas City Chiefs. So we didn't like it, but we loved it. It was a game day. It was a payday. It was uh, what you do. That's what you signed on for, and you play, and you play wherever and whenever they want to play. Well, let's, let's take the wives and that. Is this an extra paycheck, right? They couldn't be unhappy about that because we didn't make any money back in those days. And the guys were just happy to be playing. <laughs> yeah. Playing football was my second job. A lot of people didn't realize that I worked at General Motors full time. When practice was over, man, I had to put my tie stuff and run over to Fairfax and work. I was working a full-time job year-round. Dolphins kicker Garo Yapremian also knew what it meant to go moonlighting. His employment status had fluctuated frequently since his rookie season in 1966. Little Garo Yapremian is Detroit's new place-kicking specialist. Last week, he set a league record by kicking six field goals. A Cypriot, Yapremian, is one of the new breed of side-winding kickers. The Lions coaching change sent him packing the following season. And for the next two years, Garrow did not play in any NFL games. During that time, he earned a living by making and selling neckties. In 1970, he left the rag trade to join the Dolphins and rewarded their faith a year later by leading the league in scoring. I had high hopes that I would make the Pro Bowl that year because I led in kicking and percentage and so forth. But when the announcement was made, Jan Stenrud was the kicker of the Pro Bowl. I was disappointed, but I didn't have any kind of animosity. Uh, Jan seemed to be a very nice gentleman. I'd never met him before. So when we went to Kansas City during warm-ups, I saw Jan on the other side, and I went over and I said, Jan, congratulations for making the Pro Bowl. I wish you all the luck. I didn't have a really good year in 71, if I remember back. So I guess maybe the voters for 1971 was voting on my reputation, maybe, which, which happens, still happens, happened then. Stenerud's legend had first begun in his native Norway, where his ski jumping talents earned him a scholarship to Montana State. A fortunate turn of events got him a tryout with their football team. In 1966, he was drafted by the Chiefs and spent the next five years revolutionizing the kicking position. Most of the kickers in pro football in 1971 were still straightforward kickers. Taking the three steps, booting the ball through with all you had. And so there was something exotic about Stenerud, somebody who wasn't just a kicker, he was also an athlete. But Stenerud was big, above six foot, strapping, he could run. Jan Stenerud was not the first soccer style kicker, but he was the first dominant soccer style kicker. He was the first modern place kicker, and he was uniformly considered the best in the league. Stenerud will win for us, sure. <laughs> He's a dandy. He'll win for us, Stenerud. <laughs> When I grew up in Kansas City, the NFL had their blackout policy, which meant if the game was played in your home city, it didn't matter if it was sold out or not, you couldn't see it on TV. And so anybody who lived in Kansas City and wanted to see that game either had to buy one of the 50,000 tickets to go to Municipal Stadium or drive 100 miles outside of town and go see it at a hotel or, or somewhere else. You're on NBC, man. In it. Watch it, you're on TV here again. <laughs> Watch it, watch it. You're on TV again. And we're about ready for the start of the playoff game between the Chiefs and the Dolphins. Right. Offense, defense, our day. Let's win. Dawson has time. Good protection. Throws complete. Photo out. The Chiefs scored on their first possession, relying exclusively on their running backs to pick up every yard. Quick opener. Kansas City didn't reach the end zone, but did cash in with its kicker. And so Jan Stenerud will be called upon. Dawson holding at the 24. The kick in the air. And it's good. Look at the score. Kansas City 3, Miami nothing. 
Chiefs All-Pro receiver Otis Taylor would not catch a single first-half pass thanks to a Dolphins defensive decision. Well, their coordinator, Arnsbarger, was a terrific coach, and his idea was to take the lead guy out of the picture if you could, and that lead guy in that get going into that game was Otis Taylor. Otis Taylor had a great year in 1971. We would always manage to have two people on Otis Taylor. No matter where he went, he was going to get double covered. If they were going to beat us with somebody else, then God bless them. But they weren't going to beat us with Otis. Back to throw. Let's go the bomb. It is picked up. You know, they took that away and made us do something else. But fortunately for us, that something else was number 14, Ed Podlack. He was a college quarterback, and we brought him to us with the hope and expectation that we'd be able to use that ability. He wound up being our punt returner, our kick returner, great, great pass receiver, very bright route runner, and a ball carrier. Peg Stram, in his game plan, drew it up in a way that we normally draw up our game plans, which was the eye back was a big part of the game. We ran a lot of draws and screens, maybe a few more than, um, than we did in the regular season, and that's where I gained uh, quite a bit of yardage. Dawson with time, wants to throw, pumps to the left, throws to the right. The screen is set for Podolak, a block from Rundick. 35, 40, 45, 50, 45, 40, first down, Kansas City, a 29-yard game for Ed Podolak. I mean, I could run backwards faster than Ed Podolak, <laughs> you know. But, you know, he had the uh, he had the deceptive speed. Dawson dropping back, wants to throw, first and goal, complete, total act, right side, 12-5, touchdown! Ed Podolak was untouched as he went into the end zone. That play was actually a screen, and uh, we caught him in a situation uh, where I guess Otis Taylor had cleared out. And so by the time I caught the ball, I had Jack Redney and, and uh, Mo Mormon in front of me, and I really ran into the end zone untouched. Not a place where you normally run screens down near the goal line, but in that situation, it sure worked. Our offense had scored 10 points. Kind of take that situation and multiply times four. It sounds like a pretty good uh, afternoon. We well, that's the end of the first quarter with the score, Kansas City 10 and the Dolphins nothing. So far, it had been a very merry Christmas for the hometown fans. The favored Chiefs dominated the first quarter and had completely shut down Miami's running attack. When you run the ball and you go up through the middle, we would run stuff that hit really fast up in there, and I mean, it's just, you don't want to leave anything hanging off because somebody will rip it off. It was just like two trucks passing. There was some humanity colliding in there. Their defense was so big and strong that we could have continued to try to run and bash our head against the wall. So we threw the ball and we were able to get the ball down the field and it was probably the best thing to do against a team that was as big and physical as that Kansas City defense. Shula's strategy was not without risk. A month earlier, Bob Greasy had injured his non-throwing shoulder in a Monday night game against Chicago, and it was still bothering him in Kansas City. If it was my right shoulder, I probably couldn't have played, but it was the left shoulder. If you're going to have an injury, it's probably not a bad injury to have, as long as it's not too serious. So I could play with it, uh, and I, I wasn't looking to get it hit. It did bother me some, but these are the playoffs. You're going for the championship. To beat this team, we were going to have to throw more than we were going to have to run. But I wanted to throw when I wanted to throw, not when they wanted me to throw. So first and second downs were good downs to throw. We tried to pick our spots, but when it got to third and long, you just got to say, all right, guys, I need some time. You know, Warfield, do your thing. Greasy drops straight back, looks for Warfield, time count. Caught by Warfield as he got behind Emmett Thomas. Emmett was a top-notch cornerback, and deservedly so to be in the Pro Football Hall of Fame today. It was very tough to work against him. He's a little bit taller than I am, a little bit stronger. I was running a sideline pattern, and I was a pretty skillful pass pattern runner. And I thought I did a real good job of maneuvering him, giving him a move to stick him or freeze him and break away from him. 
The greasy to Warfield connection was the perfect tonic to awaken the drowsy Dolphins' attack. Here's the pass. Warfield makes the catch at the 35. Puts around a defensive man. 30, down the 25. Gets the block. Takes off another tackler. What a tremendous effort by Paul Warfield. Dolphins trying to get into this end zone. He sends his ball club. Here it is. Hand off to Zonka. He's in for the touchdown. Miami Dolphins have put some points on the board. Chiefs have the lead, but it's a precarious lead now. Well, they give me a lot of that. They give me a lot of that. Mix it up. I don't know what's going on. It's mostly combo, but they've been going some safety action. So they're working. I have, like, I have. You've seen him. He's got his back. I haven't seen him. That's why I open up. You get some the some Chiefs time. responded to Miami's score with another drive. But this one would feature a surprise finish for both teams. We worked on this all week in the film that we, we saw of the Miami Dolphins in a field goal attempt. What they tried to do is they rushed everybody, 11 guys. So Hank Stram said, OK, if the opportunity provides itself, we are going to make it look like it was going to be a field goal attempt because the um, center would snap the ball, but he wouldn't snap it to me. I was a holder. They was going to snap it to Jan Stenrud, the kicker. And I told Jan, I said, now, Jansky, make sure, make sure that you're a good actor on this kick. Look at the spot. Don't look for the ball. You'll see the flight of the ball. Bobby Bell is going to snap the ball to you, and then you're going to get the ball and run to the outside, just like our regular sweep. Mo Mormon, our right guard, is going to pull. And Buddy, our left guard, is going to pull. You follow Buddy, and you follow Mo Mormon, and go in for the touchdown. I looked at Jan, he was not looking at me, and I'm going, oh, Greg, if I snap this ball, he don't see it, it's gone. And uh, I kept waiting, I kept waiting as long as I could. And he snapped the ball to me, <laughs> and, so, and I'm on one knee, so I had nothing to do. I had to yell to Jan, Jan, got to kick it. And, you know, he was clustered, you know, out of rhythm and everything else, and he missed the field goal. Bobby Bell, high snap, placement by Dawson, kick in the air. I asked Bobby, why did you snap it to me? It was supposed to go to Jan. He said it, it didn't look like he was ready to catch it. And I said, that was the whole idea of the thing. It was a little bit unusual circumstances with only me and my teammate know about. And I had never really commented on that. It's been 40 years ago. And I, there's no reason for me to start commenting on it now. It still was a possibility that I could have made the kick, even though I didn't expect the kick. But in my view, that isn't the kick that cost us the ball game. The special teams breakdown had taken away Chiefs points. And late in the half, a rare mistake from the otherwise perfect Podolak was equally as damaging. We had the ball near our own goal line. We were running out the time, uh, kind of before halftime, and I got hit on the ball. Here's the handoff, Podolak through the middle, and he fumbles the ball! That's a huge momentum changer when Podolak fumbles. Now the game is going to be tied. The Apremian, the kick, it's in the air, and it is good. It's all over for you today. That makes a huge difference going in. Those guys were like riding high, then all of a sudden, boom. The Chiefs opened the third quarter with their best drive of the game. The fake up the middle to Hayes. Dawson throws under pressure up the middle. Complete elbow right. First down, Kansas City. After a quiet first half, star receiver Otis Taylor finally contributed. Well, Otis Taylor had uh, caught the ball downfield. I was just running trying to get a block, and Otis was so strong that he just kind of pushed the defensive back away and, when, and got the ball in his other hand and saw me coming and just tossed the ball to me, and it ended up being a big play. Oh, 
for Jim Otis to get the ball near the goal line, uh, it was a situation where you just try to blow it in, and Jim Otis was that kind of bat. They keep sticking them big cats at us. They're sticking at it. Shula's Dolphins needed a spark and got it from their battered quarterback, whose next drive was a portrait of perfection. I think we all knew that Bob couldn't throw the ball deep. Matter of fact, it, it probably wasn't a game where you were going to go, go deep many times. Basically, his game was going to be 15 to 20 yards, and I think Kansas City knew that. I think Bob would go back for a pass. If it wasn't there, he was very good at his checkdowns. He was very good at maneuvering around to get somebody open. He is a tough kid, a very talented guy, and uh, too bad it wasn't his right arm that was sore. <laughs> Sometimes you have to scramble. It's just there, and you have to go, and you want to pick up a first down, and you try to protect your body or whatever was hurting because you don't want to hurt your team, you want to stay in the game, and then everybody comes to help you up, and they want to come, and they're all grabbing for your left arm, and I no, 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 no. Uh, and I don't want to pull up my right arm because, you know, that's the arm I throw with, so I'll just get up myself. You know, I appreciate you coming, appreciate your support, but maybe next year or two or three games down the road. Reefy drops the throw, fires the middle, Warfield, 15 down to the 10, down to the seven yard line is Paul Warfield. We need this one desperately. Here's a handoff. And in for the touchdown. In for the touchdown. Jim Kick. And it's the tie ball game. Early in the fourth quarter of the longest game ever, the underdog Miami Dolphins were in position to take their first lead of the game. We have some plays that we like, and we've been running these plays all year, and we know that they know, but we just figure that, you know, we're going to hit them. It was a little option route to Jim Kick, the halfback. Bob threw the pass, and he, he wanted it back immediately because he threw it right at me. Gracie fires. It is intercepted from there. It's the biggest defensive play in the game for Kansas City. The right side of the field, call somebody like an 880 fan dragging up. And let me run up on the guy because he, he goes back so far, and then he, you know, he drops. He drops him. Come on, get him out there. Come on, he's there. I wanted that input from Elmo because if he tells me he can do something, I know one thing, he's going to bust his butt to do what he said he's capable of doing. I don't know whether I'll be able to stand it. And you folks listening at home, if you got a bad ticker, I think you better turn off the radio. It looks like another one of those wild finishes. Quick count by Dawson, back to throw under a little pressure, looking for the home run. Elmo right, he has the ball. So we get the ball with six or seven minutes to play, and all we need is a touchdown to tie. So we move the ball down the field, and it's mainly with the pass. Uh, these fellows are playing like, well, like landing a war field, but it was Bobby Bell who made the great defensive save. And Dick, this could be the biggest third down play in 1971. Great pressure, complete up the middle of the war field, the 45, the 43 yard line. Easy wants to throw, he does. And it's complete to work here. 20, 15, down at the 12 yard line, inbound. Clock moves, it's first down, Miami. 
Rolling right. Breezy wants the throw. On the run. Complete to the four-yard line. So we get down inside the 10. I called the same play. Lynch intercepted. Option route to kick out of the backfield. And I also have an option to throw it to Warfield. He's on that side as well. So I back up. I'm looking left. And they got it covered. I wasn't open, <laughs> that's for sure. Greasy was flushed out of the pocket. And he looks up and he finds Mar Fleming, who was a great, great blocking tight end. It is caught. Touchdown is the call. Mar Fleming is the man who caught the touchdown pass. Dolphins are right back in it with a best 36 to go. With the game on the line, the ball would be kicked to the player who was having the game of his life. Podolak and McVeigh at the goal line, and Yepremian's kick is in the air. Podolak at the one, up the middle, 10, the 15, 20, 25, 30. Podolak appeared headed for the go-ahead score. The only player in his way was the tie maker himself, Dolphins kicker, Gero Yoprimian. I said, oh my goodness, I can't let him just keep on coming. I have to slow him down. So I saw him angling to go slightly to the right. I closed the gap and made sure that he started making his move to the left. When I swerved to avoid him, it uh, gave Curtis Johnson an angle on me. Curtis Johnson came and pushed him out of bounds. It was like a godsend, but I still said, oh boy, here we are. We got a minute left in the ball game, 24-24. And guess who they have? They have Jan Stenerud, probably the greatest kicker in history. He's going to kick a field goal and beat us. That's it. You know, Stenerud, the best kicker in the league, is going to make the kick. So we just thought we gave it our best. They just, they took it away from us. And Jan Stenerud comes on the field. Stenerud, who made the American Conference All-Star team, even though he was the second scorer to Gary Yepremian of Miami, considered by many to be the best money kicker in the game. The man who can really come through in the clutch. Jan is really being called on for the biggest one now in his career. It was a short kick. It was about half a minute to go, 31 yards. Uh... A kick that I should probably have made 49 out of 50, particularly with a, uh, a good snap and a good hold. this day, I don't really understand why I missed that kick. It's a very painful, hurtful thing because you not only do you disappoint yourself, but you cost the team a chance to go further into the playoffs. So you let down the team uh, and coaches and uh, millions of fans. So it, it's, it's tough to take and I, I feel totally responsible for missing that kick. Probably crying his eyes out right now. That's got to be the saddest thing that's the moment in his young life. I was on the south side of Chicago in Evergreen Park, Illinois, at my grandparents' house with my mom, watching the game on TV. All the way through the game, I knew the Chiefs were going to win. And then Stenerud misses the field goal. What I remember following that, an interminable excruciating overtime so painful I had to force myself to watch it at the end of regulation in the longest game ever the Chiefs forced a punt with time for one more play Hank Stram contemplated trying a 68 yard field goal Oh, wait, what happens if it don't kick, though? It might as well kick, though. No, we just, we're going to sudden death. Go for it, baby. How far? 68 yards. Go. We can't take a chance of blowing a damn thing now. 
Stram played for sudden death overtime, something he and Len Dawson had experienced nine years earlier when the Kansas City Chiefs were the Dallas Texans. The game is tied 17 17. The big rush is on, the kick is up, the kick is good. Dallas is the champion. At the time, that was the longest pro football game ever played 77 minutes and 55 seconds. This game would be longer. The premium from his own 35. This is a low one, a line drive, and it comes to Buck Buchanan, a lateral to the line to the 20, the 25, the 30, the 35, outside, gets away from 1 minute 40, 45, 46 yard line. Each team had a field goal chance in the first overtime. The kick is blocked, and it comes down to the 25 yard line. Hit by your premium in the air. It went beyond four quarters. It went beyond five quarters. Definitely Christmas dinner got put on hold. In double overtime, the Chiefs continued to give the ball to Ed Podolak. I'm sure he was tired. I didn't care what he felt like. I was going to get him the football because, you know, he was having a phenomenal day. Also having a game for the ages was Dolphins linebacker Nick Bonaconti, who finished with 20 tackles. I remember Podolak catching his pass. I tackle him, and as, as we fall, I, I literally push his head into the mud because the mud is everywhere. And I'm thinking, Ed's going to come up, and he's going to be cussing me out like a trooper. I remember looking up at him and saying, do you think this thing will ever end? Um, and I don't know how many times we ran into each other that afternoon, but it was a many, many times. The Chiefs landed many hits, too. <laughs> But the Dolphins and their injured quarterback, Bob Greasy, refused to stay down. You know, we're going to play until somebody dies or somebody wins. I mean, it's just the way it is. Mud was getting deep. Boy, it was in your eyes, in your ears, up your nose. You know, it was everywhere. I lost like 18 pounds that day. I lost so much weight that my pants were loose. Working in Miami, and we, we feel like we're in better shape than most teams because of the heat in Miami. You know, we were tired, but we knew that if we're retired, they've got to be more tired than we are. Just give us one chance. Just give us one drive. Just give us one big play. That's all we needed. So I'm, I'm looking at my chart, and I see the defenses that they're playing in different situations, and on the back sheet, I've got my plays listed that I like. And here was this play that was one of our favorite plays and one of our best plays that I hadn't run yet, but I had forgotten about it. It was called Roll Right, Trap Left. When I called this play in the huddle, I'm looking at the center and the two guards and the tackle, and Zonka's next to me. I could see the eyes light up. Where's this play been all day, you know? Yeah, I've forgotten about it. Hand off, big hole, Sanka, 50, 45, 40, down to the 36-yard line. The first part of the horror began when I saw Zonka break through on a give-it play, and he had all that uh, open field in front of him, and you knew he was going to end up in field goal range. Here comes little Gary Premier. Football. The only thing you can do is just hope that he's going to miss this one. The ball is right directly at the center of the playing field. This will be an approximate 37-yard attempt. If Garrow makes it, the Dolphins win. I didn't expect him to make it. I really didn't because so many things had gone wrong that day. The game had gone on. I didn't really expect it to end. Waiting for the snap. Somebody jumps the team, gets back. Here's a pass cut down. The kick is up. He's got the distance. It's good. The Dolphins win. As soon as I hit it, I knew it was good. I turned my back and I raised my arms. By then, I saw the biggest happy grin on Coach Shula's face. The Dolphins win. Jeff Trimmy is 37 yards, and the Dolphins are in the AFC Championship game.
it happened, and it happened against one of the greatest teams that I've ever played against. I tease about Gary Premium getting all the credit, people running and picking him up, and I lost 18 pounds. I'm looking out my ear hole, my pants are falling off. But when he kicked that field goal, I could have kissed him, brother. I was so glad to get off that field. I think we're worn out. I think that everyone knew that we fought a good fight. I didn't feel any great dejection. Obviously, we lost, but we lost to a worthy foe. I can't ever recall feeling that way about a loss before. I would not like to go back and relive that again. I'm happy with the way it turned out. To look back on those games and memories, that's what being an ex-NFLer is all about. The most interesting part of that game was really when we got home in Miami. The radio announcers encouraged people to go to the airport and meet the Dolphins. And darned if 10,000 people didn't show up at the Miami airport. Plane lands, we go out to the parking lot to get in my car and, and it won't start. <laughs> and all the cars were leaving. So, you know, I, I didn't know what to do. So I just thought that the, the best thing for, for me to do would be start hitchhiking. The car picked me up. They were so happy to take me home. And then when we got to my house, all the neighbors had gotten there and were happy about the game and they're having this big celebration party. And this strange car pulls up and lets me out and I walk into my party. The Chiefs have played, as Coach Hank Stram would say, with Great pride and great determination went for nothing because the Chiefs now are eliminated from the playoffs of 1971. There was people crying. There was people just uh, hugging each other. Like, you know, I can't believe this happened. You know, it just tore their hearts out. And it still bothers me because I truly think that that was the best team that Kansas City Chiefs ever had. Unfortunately, it ended up being the end of an era for us because you can look at the record and see what happened. The Chiefs did not win another division title for 22 years. After the longest game ever, they moved into Arrowhead Stadium. In the opener, they again lost to Miami. Going back to Kansas City and beating that team again, validating the victory on Christmas Day, 1971. And that laid the groundwork for the undefeated season of 72. In Super Bowl VII, the Dolphins were in position to cap a 17-0 season with a 17-0 victory over the Washington Redskins. A 42-yard attempt by your premier. Snaps them down. The kick is blocked. Rolling loose on the field. It is picked up by Gill. He tries to throw a pass. To the aircraft by Bass. 40, 35, 30. He's going to score. Manny Fernandez went up to him and said, Garrow, if we lose this game, I'm going to take one of your ties. I'm going to string you up on the 50-yard line. The Dolphins did not lose the game. They would also win the Super Bowl the following season. And Garrow's gaffe became merely an amusing footnote. For Chiefs kicker Jan Stenerud, what followed after his lowest moment was very different. That uh, night after the game, uh, I was home and Jan called. And uh, he was really down. He felt it was on his shoulders. And I had to explain to Jan, I said, Jan, we wouldn't even have been in that game if it hadn't been for your performance during the regular season. Teammates would always say, hey, listen, you've done a good job for you help us win a lot of games. You know, it isn't all your fault. But I'm the kind of a person, and I feel the, uh, the without a doubt, the main reason we lost that game was because I had a miserable day. But what is amazing to me is that 40 years later, that when it comes up and the Christmas time rolls around, that it still is painful. Not quite as painful as it was at the time. But it's amazing to me that time has not, uh, that those feelings haven't faded, faded away more than, more than they have. So when I see a, a young kid today missing a crucial kick, 
Um, I won't tell him that, but I will. I fully understand that that's something. It doesn't go away next year. It doesn't go away after the next game when they kick. It, it stays with you a long, long time. Stenerud considered quitting football following the 1971 season. He didn't. He played 14 more years and retired as the record holder for most career field goals. To this day, he is the only pure kicker in the Hall of Fame. Fifteen future Hall of Famers participated in the longest game ever. Twelve players, two coaches, and one owner. The game itself lasted 82 minutes and 40 seconds, a record that still stands. Ed Podolak's 350 all-purpose yards that day is still the most ever in a playoff game. Because it was on Christmas Day and it was a nationally televised game, a lot of my peers saw the game. And because of that, I was invited to some events where I got to meet people like Mickey Mantle and Yogi Berra and Johnny Unitas. And, you know, you walk into a room and you see your idols in there and you say, and they all know your name. You say, my gosh, I made it. Forty years later, the longest game ever remains one of the most memorable in NFL history. But in all that time, the footage from that game has rarely been seen. When was the last time you saw footage of that game? Forty years ago. Would you want to see some of it? I, I would love to see some of it. I can still catch the ball. <laughs> I want to show it to my son, Brian, because he played in the league. I just want to show him how the old man can still get outside the pocket, you know? He thought all I did was just hand the ball off to Zonka. I was at my good friend Violet's house. It was Christmas Day. We were only married six months, and I'm, still, I'm almost as nervous now watching this film. As soon as I kicked the ball, I raised my arms, and I'm running, and here comes Coach Shula a big smile on his face. I travel throughout the country and everywhere I go, at airports and different places, people come up with their kids and they go, there's the guy who messed up on that uh, pass. Finally, people are going to see the longest game ever and me kicking the winning field goal. Christmas is a great time for people to buy ties. That day, there was no tie. We won the game. And of all people, I was a tie salesman. I broke the tie that day.